I'm Cindy Briggs, and this is Soldier's Heart. When I was a little girl, I loved nothing more than to sit and listen to my granddaddy swap stories with his four brothers. They'd sit in folding chairs on the lawn in the dappled sunlight of a summer evening and remember their lives together, laughing, always laughing. My favorite story was the time the preacher caught them playing baseball on a Sunday afternoon in the red tobacco field of their family farm. He demanded to know where their daddy was so he could tell him of their sinful acts. The oldest of the boys pointed off in the distance. He's right over there, he said, playing third base. I grew up surrounded by these happy, storytelling men, all tall and strong, all snowy white hair and bright blue eyes, always happy to see me. When I was a little kid, I tried to make friends with every white-haired man I saw. They instantly felt like family. They were all my granddaddy. When I first met Jewel Spock, it was like being with my grandfather again, a little bit like coming home. Big smile, blue eyes, white hair, instant family. And it's good to know you, Cindy. Thank good you so to be much. with you, too. Oh, it's good to be with you. <laughs> Jewel Spock was the very first veteran I interviewed. He was a World War II pilot in the Army Air Corps. One of the first things he said about his time in Europe was that he'd spent his 21st birthday in a German prisoner of war camp. He said it with a laugh, like this funny, weird thing that happened to him once. My granddaddy did that too, turning tragedy into comedy. It's a coping mechanism combat veterans often use when they tell their stories to non-vets, a way to tell the truth without reliving painful memories or scaring the listener away. I hoped I'd prove myself trustworthy enough for the real story, because Jewel had quite a story to tell. We met on a cold day in late January 2014 at his home. Jewel was getting over a head cold and apologized for his voice being a bit scratchy. His lovely wife, Nancy, brought us water, offered coffee, and then excused herself to watch TV in the den. We settled into wing chairs in the picture window as Jewel described joining the Army Air Corps during his first year at the Virginia Military Institute. Jewel chose VMI because he'd been a bit of a wild child growing up. He liked sports and girls and driving in the little red car he owned with his best friend. His family hoped VMI might settle him down. This was February of 1943. He was 19 years old. There's something, at least for me, there was something exciting about the whole idea of being a pilot. Uh, in, my, in your youth like that, I didn't see it as, as any danger. I didn't see, I saw it more as a big adventure that I was going to have. I was going to learn how to fly. I was going to get an airplane up in the air. And somehow Air Force pilots always seem to have fancy uniforms than anybody else. <laughs> and I saw myself in a, a, a handsome young second lieutenant in a uniform, you know, flying around and just flying all over the country. Jewel completed pilot training and was assigned to a B-24 Liberator bomber. This was the long-range heavy bomber used by the U.S. and England in the war. The bodies of the Silver Plains gleamed, with four engines and a range of 1,600 miles. Nearly 18,000 were built between 1940 and 1945. Jewel had his plane and his crew, and his dream of being a pilot was about to come true. But before he left for Europe, he had one trick left up his sleeve. I got here, and then I thought, you know, wouldn't this be great? It was right in the morning. Wouldn't this be great just to buzz around high school? 
So I came in from over Ardmore, which is south of town, and I dropped down and I went through Haynes Park, almost on the ground, with all my four motors roaring. And it was so much fun that I turned around and I came back. <laughs> and by the time I came back, well, the school was out. <laughs> In fact, a lot of the people who are today almost my age who were students, then they said, when that heard that roar, why they didn't know what was happening, and everybody started running out to see, and they stood up on this parapet there and watched the airplane go by, and we just waved out of as we went by, and I pulled up, and and if I'd gotten caught, well, I expect <laughs> I would have ended up in the infantry on the front lines, yeah. but fortunately, I didn't get caught. Soon after, Jewel and his crew were off to Europe, assigned to the 15th Air Corps in southern Italy. It was from there that he piloted bombing runs all over Europe. From the first minute of his arrival on the base, Jewel's fantasy of himself as a handsome young second lieutenant in a sharp uniform collided with the harsh reality of war. That's when the war became a reality for me and for all of us on the crew. And as we were landing in Italy, and it just landed and pulled the airplane off the runway and was sitting there unloading our baggage. And the mission of that day from our, our group was returning from battle. And we sat there and just, we, we quit unpacking and we watched them come in and land. Toward the end, while there was a plane came and shot out a red flare and we realized that it was really crippled. It had been shot up and it was coming in for a landing. And then right before it got off the ground, why well, it fell. And when it fell, it blew up. And so we were watching all of this. This is my baptism into combat before I even unpacked my bags. And uh, we watched all, it was a very terrible because we could see some of the men get out and a lot didn't get out. but. Uh, but it was, a, it was quite an experience. A week after his arrival, Jewel and his crew took off on their first bombing run to southern France. An easy mission, a milk run, as they called it on base. They encountered no enemy opposition and no planes were lost. The following missions over Hungary and Germany were not so easy. Hundreds of planes took to the sky, carrying tons of bombs and thousands of airmen. There they were met with German fighting planes, Messerschmitt 109s, and flak from anti-aircraft guns on the ground. For the first time, Jewel heard the chatter of pilots all around him fighting for their lives. He saw planes go down and men jumping from fiery ruins. Even though he was only a few feet away, there was nothing he could do. It was a helpless feeling. So he was relieved to find his fifth mission was to be another easy milk run, to Genoa on August 4th, 1943. Jewel and his crew took off in formation, flying high over the Mediterranean Sea. It was a beautiful day, blue sky, blue water. Then his engineer, a man named Harry Fowler, stuck his head into the cockpit to let Jewel know they had a problem. Oil wasn't getting to the engines and Fowler couldn't figure out why. One by one, the engines cut out until Jewel and his crew found themselves drifting silently 18,000 feet over the Mediterranean. Jewel sent out the Mayday distress call, but there wasn't time to wait. They had no choice but to abandon their plane, parachuting into the sea below. The men became separated during the jump, and once he hit the water, Jewel found himself alone. He quickly shed his parachute clothing and combat boots, dead weight that threatened to drag him to the bottom of the sea. Then he began the long swim to shore, a mountain in the far distance. After an hour, American planes finally arrived in response to their distress call, but they weren't able to help. German artillery on shore began to fire at the planes right over Jules' head. Artillery shells pounded the water all around him. 
But when the airplanes flew over looking for us, they began to fire to shoot at the fighter planes looking to rescue us. So being 3,000 up, 3,000 feet up, mm -hmm. and uh, we swimming in the water at sea level, they began to fire down at us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the trajectory came pouring into the water around us. And again, I felt I was going to die. And Cindy, I, I began to pray. And I think for the first time, maybe in a real way, I looked at my life and I knew I was going to hell. And all of a sudden, this huge peace came over me right there in the midst of all of this. And the, the firing stopped. And I suddenly realized that I just felt this peace. After hours in the water, well into the night, Jewel reached the shore and began to climb the mountain. He encountered two Italian women and a terraced vineyard. He did not speak Italian and they did not speak English, but they appeared to be friendly. They gestured to the top of the mountain and then helped him move from terrace to terrace. One woman went ahead to make sure it was safe while the other stayed with Jewel. In this way, they reached the top of the mountain and walked into the village. They almost reached the women's cottage in safety when Jewel heard a man's voice and the women fled. I turned around and it was an Italian man. He was a Nazi, because you remember the Italians fought for Hitler for a long time and he was a Nazi. And he got, he, he, he got me, he had gun on me. And his words went, damn the Americano, damn the Americano, that were his words. And he arranged it, he got the Germans he called the Germans and they marched me around, beat me up pretty bad for a while, which I don't even remember. I only know this from later contact from people I made contact in the village who saw them beat me up. I don't remember that. And anyway, they carried me off to the prison camp. You may have missed that last statement from Jewel, so easily does he drop it into the conversation. From this point, he was sent to a German prisoner of war camp, specifically Stalag Luft III, near the border of Poland, a neighbor of Auschwitz. This was a camp specifically for Air Corps officers. It was run by the German Luftwaffe, the German Aerial Warfare Branch. These camps were overseen by Hermann Göring, Hitler's right-hand man, creator of the Gestapo secret police and the second most powerful man in the Nazi party. He was a pilot himself, a veteran of World War I. Göring respected officers, so Jewel's prison camp experience was not the horror that many enlisted men faced. However, he was never unaware that he was, in fact, in prison. The way, the way it worked for all of us, it was about 10 feet high, a fence, all the way around the entire prison camp. And about every 50 yards, it was a tower. And on top of the tower was a box. And in that box was a German guard. He had a machine gun and a machine gun, had a searchlight and a telephone. If we were ever to try to s slip through the wire or, or any way get out the door or go into a space of about 20, about 20 yards from the fence back to a little, a little lower fence that was only about a foot and a half high, we could not, that was no man's land. We could not go in that area. And if we went in that area, they had the responsibility to shoot you. But this one man, he was a cook. And we, what that particular day, a large formation of bombers, of Allied bombers, were flying over. And he's, you're, 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 you're absolutely required to go in, any time enemy air, aircraft overhead, you to go into the buildings that you're in, close the doors and stay there until a siren goes off to tell you to come back out. And he stuck his head out to look at the airplanes that were flying overhead and that was against the rule and the, the guards the, they, that was their obligation to shoot him and they did. He made the mistake of not obeying the rules. Jules' empathy for the responsibility of the guards fascinates me. These are the people tasked with murder should prisoners step out of line but it's clear that Jules feels sort of sorry for them. I think his attitude is both a testimony to his own character but also an indicator of the endless nuances of war. It's harder to draw firm conclusions about right and wrong 
good and bad, when living with the enemy. In addition to athletic equipment from the YMCA and food from the Red Cross, the prisoners also received lumber and materials to build an auditorium where they put on monthly plays and performances. Jewel recalls that one English prisoner wrote out the entire musical score of The Messiah from memory for their Christmas production. Here, the guards also joined in. Whenever we had those, all the German officers would come and sit on the front row and they would enjoy enjoy. it. So that way we kept ourselves occupied, but they're always behind it. We didn't know what the future would behold. uh, But... uh, Somehow you just felt like, we're going to get home. Mm -hmm. By February of 1945, the beginning of the end had arrived. The Allied forces had broken through the German offense to the west. The Russian troops were closing in from the east. The noose had dropped around the neck of the Nazi party, and it began to tighten. And then one night, why the word came, because by then we could even see flares of light on the horizon. That's how close the Russians were. And we were to march, and so it was 20 below zero, and then the blizzard was snowing hard. And we marched, and we marched for four days and four nights with a little bit of sleep. Several people didn't make it. I don't know. I, it had, one that no one really knows for sure how many didn't make it. We call it, it's called the death march though because I just know for sure some die. And interesting, we marched by threes so that if one of us fell, there was two of us there to help that guy on. Mm-hmm. And that, that paved the way a lot to save a lot of people. Even the German guards, because our guards were old men. All Anybody who was able to fight was sent to the front against the Russians. I, one time, one of man, with the Germans was so tired, I took his rifle, I carried his rifle, and we walked along beside each other together. I felt so sorry for him. He was an old man. We made it through the march, and they loaded us into boxcars. And that was a terrible experience. And crammed us into these cattle cars, and, and it was filthy, dirty. We stayed in there for three days did get water, couldn't go to the bathroom, but once. And we finally got to the prison camp, another different prison camp, had a hundred thousand people in it. They had been through some pretty terrible experiences in this new camp of starvation. We were very hungry. A lot of people very sick, very dirty. And we didn't know really what the future was going to be because this was a much different situation from over at Stalag Lou 3. And then we knew Patton was coming, and all day long the battle was fought. And we and, and we began to notice that all the Germans were gone. And so we, we didn't know what this meant for us. And suddenly a great big GI tank came barreling in, knocked down the front gate. And it didn't, it didn't stop, it kept right on going. And it went right over the flagpole. And we watched as the flag went, as the swastika went down. And the American stars and stripes went up. And I'll never forget it. It's awful hard to believe, but truly, it's what happened. A hundred thousand men, a hundred thousand men, all screaming at the top of their voice as we watched that flag go up. It told us at last we were free and we were going home. (laughs) And that's what that means to me. After his liberation, Jewel, the 100,000 other POWs in his camp, 
and all the rest began their long journey home. First by plane to Camp Lucky Strike in France, where they were given clean clothes, food, and medical care. Then to Le Havre, where he boarded an ocean liner to New York City and home. It was at Camp Kilmer in New Jersey, where he was finally able to call his family, and he could barely speak through the tears. Jules' time in the Army Air Corps was coming to a swift conclusion. But the adventure of his life would continue, and it would be hallmarked by good fortune, coincidence, and providence. First, he headed to Georgia Tech to start his college degree on the GI Bill. Standing in line at the registrar, he struck up a conversation with the guy in front of him. Turns out that guy was also a veteran, also from Winston-Salem, and also held in the same POW camp as Jewel. They became roommates and lifelong friends. Jewel settled into college life and resumed dating, even becoming engaged to a young woman. But his heart kept drifting back to a girl he knew from home, Nancy, who was quite inconveniently dating his best friend. By now, Jewel had solidified his relationship with God, so he prayed about his feelings and eventually admitted the truth to himself his fiancé, his friend, and most importantly to Nancy. They married, and Jewel counts that among the best decisions of his life. And I I want to say, too, that life would not be what it is if it wasn't for my wife, Nancy. She's she's really something. She's, uh, she never's down. She's always happy. She loves everybody. And she just kind of keeps me on the right road when I start to get the stray. Why she kind of calls to my attention, I'm straying and trying to get me back on the right road again. But, but she's a great gal. I, God blessed me with a wonderful wife. The two became missionaries and spent the next three decades in Brazil, where they raised four children, ran a school, taught an estimated half a million people to read, developed textbooks, and aspired to empower the poor to be leaders in their communities. As his reputation and leadership in Brazil grew, he was invited to Europe to forge new bonds with the Christian leadership community. His travels took him to Italy, where he thought back to that plane crash in 1943, and to the two women who tried to save him from the Nazis. But the only piece of information he had was the name of the town where he'd been captured by the Germans, La Spezia, a small coastal city of nearly 90,000 people. Those ladies had uh, hit me, tried to help me escape from the Germans. I went uh, up in the area, and I, th- I didn't know who they were. I didn't know what their names were. Thirty years had passed. I didn't know what they looked like. So, but I found both of them. I found both of them. And we had this fantastic reunion together. They thought I had been killed. And I discovered that they would carry it off to prison because... The man who arrested me, who was a Nazi, told the Germans who they were, and they were to be taken to Buchenwald. But they were saved by the secretary of the German commandant who knew them and said they were just poor, simple little peasant ladies. I've got their pictures. Uh, you are talking right here. I can show you their pictures, in fact, of what they looked like. They both died in their 90s, but we... We, we, we've gone back two or three times to see them since then and had these wonderful readings, and we still corresponded with their children. Eventually, Jewel and Nancy returned to Winston-Salem, where they continued to be active in the community, in their church, and with their many friends and family in the area. My life has been one continuous adventure from beginning and I'm well, came to believe the day's coming for too long because I'm already 90. But, but it's it's uh, it's it's been a wonderful life has been a wonderful experience for Nancy and for me. One final note: Nancy Spock died on July 5th, 2018. She made an incredible impression on me with her grace and love for her family and community, and she is well-remembered for the amazing person that she was.
Soldier's Heart is written and produced by me, Cindy Briggs, and features veteran stories from North Carolina. We honor vets by listening to their stories. You can follow along on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Soldier's Heart NC. If you have an idea for a story or interview, email us at soldiersheartnc at gmail.com. Special thanks to the New Winston Museum of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where all of these stories are archived. You can learn more about the museum at newwinston.org.